and I can pretend like I remember. Okay, well, today's speaker really needs no introductions, which is proud, but it's my pleasure to have this opportunity to introduce Dr. Tangy Lee, who you may remember from last year. Um, Tang got her undergraduate degree at Fudan University in, in China, um, the best university in China. In Shanghai. In Shanghai. Uh, from there, she went and got a master's degree in Europe at some institution that I don't remember, uh, doing space science instrumentation kind of stuff, which inspired her interest in astronomical instrumentation, which led her to deign to come to this university and work with Darren on an instrumentation part of her thesis. And I was privileged to work with her on the observation part of her thesis, which is not what she's going to talk to you about today, because as of a year before she graduated, she has taken off and been the principal, one of the main reasons why the DES Milky Way Working Group has been able to publish 10 papers or so, 15 papers, I don't know, and Ting's name is near the top of every single one of them, if not at the top. Um, so she's really done a lot of really excellent work in the last few years on following up the DES discoveries, which I presume is what you're going to, I didn't even read the title of your talk, I presume that's what you're going to talk about. Is that's, anyway, that's what I'm going to be talking with her about all week. So, Thank you. Thanks, Jim, for a very nice introduction. And yes, I'm Ting, and I think I know most of you except for a few new faces that, because uh, I left around uh, before the semester starts last year. And as Jim said, uh, if you remember a year ago, I kind of in the same room gave the thesis presentation. And the thing I'm going to talk about today is not really the same topic. I'll say it's not the work I did in, in my in my thesis paper. So it's, I guess it's good because I actually work move on and have new results come out I'm going to share with you, which is not something I shared with you a year ago. So it will be uh, mainly talking about the Milky Way satellite galaxy that we discovered in the dark energy today. And my talk will be in three parts. Uh, motivation starts with, and then I'll talk about method and focus on spectroscopy, and then the result. The result mainly focus on the two papers we publish. And there's a secret part that after this is, if you have questions, I will answer you the unpublished result, which is not here. And I appreciate later on when you have the video recording, that part will be clipped and then before you uh -huh. the website. <laughs> but anyway, uh, and I'll have to say, have 80 slides, which I didn't expect, but I couldn't make it smaller. So I hope I don't go delay you too much time for that. But Did I'm you say 80? 80, 80, 80. <laughs> you will see. She learned from her, her advisor. <laughs> I hope it's, not, it's something you get. You learn. Anyway, so let's start with the motivation. And then I'll, I'll bring up my motivation to three parts of why we're working on the dwarf galaxies in the Milky Way from near field cosmology, galaxy formation, and indirect dark matter detection. Okay, so start with the near field. So that's that's two slides already, just so you know. <laughs> so start with the near field cosmology. Why we want to do this? So, but b before I start with these nearby dwarf galaxies, I want to start with the large scale structure. So this is a very famous plot showing you that the large scale structure from the observations here in the blue and the simulations in the red. So what you see here are the observations that from Sloan and from other surveys. Each dot here in the blue our uh, galaxy. And here is from the Lander CDM the simulations, and each dot here is a dark matter subhill. And you can see that the simulation and the observation, this is about redshift to 0 to 0.1, this is redshift 0 to 0.2, I think. So, and you want to look, compare this one with this one, and that with that. So you can see the observation and simulation matches very well. This tells us two things. One is the galaxies reside in dark matter halo. The second is the universe in larger scale structure. The, the structure formation is well described by lambda CDM model. It's lambda dark energy plus the cold dark matter. And now we can go to our local universe. And this is simulation zoom in. Instead of this 5 megaparsec to uh, 1,000 megaparsec, we go to a 1 megaparsec uh, simulation box. And this is the dark matter only simulation that we see here. And the, the scale corresponding to the dark matter density. Again, if our Milky Way, if this is a Milky, our Milky Way site, so this is kind of the center of the Milky Way and what we see. Visible light is really That happens almost every day. There's another equation for neural connection. Okay, 
So, so this is what we see visibly in the, uh, the visible component of baryons. And uh, these are the dark matter halos. And you hope these first two work. Yes. And then if you look at one of these dark matter subhalos, if it has stars there and that's kind of the dark matter, uh, uh, the, the star galaxy we see, and these are the dwarf galaxies we're talking about. So this is corresponding to our local Milky Way so, uh, halo. And actually, in reality, in our Milky Way, if you go to look at our Milky Way and then its satellite galaxies, this is what we see. So we do see some small uh, uh, galaxies around the our Milky Way halo, and each of them like that, it was in the dark matter subhalo. Hope I can do this. And if you have a chance ever go to the southern sky, you can see this by eye. This is the largest two uh, Milky Way satellites that you actually can see with a naked eye. One is the large magenta cloud and one is the small magenta cloud. And that's the uh, two uh, satellites of our Milky Way. However, if you look at these simulations, you will see that uh, the simulation predicts thousands of them. But then if you come uh, check the number of dwarf galaxies that we know in our Milky Way as a function of the discovery here, you can see that up to 2,000, we only know about a dozen of them. So this really comes out of a problem we call missing satellite problem, or really uh, like dark matter, cold dark matter crisis at the, uh, about the late 2000. So the CDM, the cold dark matter simulations, predicts 500 to 1,000 luminous subhalos for Milky Way science galaxy, but the Milky Way only hosts about a dozen or dozens of known galaxies. So the question immediately come up with a simulation role, like instead of cold dark matter, should we go to warm, warm dark matter or self-interacting dark matter to solve this problem? All this might just observational bias that we don't see the most of those dwarf galaxies, but they are there. Another thing I want to point out at the beginning when I say this is a good match between the Lander CDM model and the observation. Really, I'm saying it's ruling out the hot dark matter because at the warm dark matter regime, the prediction from the, the simulation will, on the larger scale structure, will have the same behavior as the cold dark matter. So really, root dark, uh, hot dark matter has been ruled out from large scale structure. But the warm dark matter is still possible in this. Uh, uh, this picture, even though this simulation is done with cold dark matter, but there will be no difference in the large scale structure for the for the uh, for the warm dark matter simulation. So this is really the birth of near field cosmology, which is saying that we can use the nearby galaxies to constrain the nature of dark matter. And because the cold dark matter and warm dark matter will have very different predictions in the small, small scale structure, not those larger scale structure that I showed before, in terms of the matter power spectra, the subhalo mass function, the density profile, the halo shape, etc. And the missing subtle problem is really just one part of the subhalo uh, mass function and uh, that I'm touching today. But if you're interested in other topics, I'm happy to talk about that. Question. Mm -hmm. How fast does warm dark matter move? Uh, you can. So, you there's hot dark matter. It goes nearly the speed of light, right? Yes. Yeah, so it's really relative. So how warm is warm? Well, I think uh, cold dark matter is zero. Yeah. Is Louis here? <laughs> so uh, cold dark matter is zero, and the warm dark matter is really anything between zero and, and the speed of light in reality, right? But in terms of it, I think, okay, I might answer different. And in terms of energy level, when, when we talk about wind, which I'll mention later, it's really at a 100 GeV level. And for warm dark matter, it's really at a KeV level. And that's, that's how we talk about the, 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 the difference between between the, the warm dark matter and the, and the cold dark matter. So cold dark matter is at, uh, yeah, it's at MeV or KeV level, and uh, the warm dark matter is at uh, a few KeV level. Yeah, that's in terms of the mass. So really the question is like when? Like it was moving when? fast in the early universe. So they're all moving in the halo at about the same speed, 220 kilometers per second. But like the question is, it's warm because it was born. Yeah, it was born right. fast. Mm -hmm. It was cold dark matter, it was born slow. But it must, there must be some like velocity metric in terms of like streaming velocities. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah, that's right. So, um, yeah, so you think about like, you can, um, yeah, you can do that. So that's a free streaming scale, and there's a free streaming length associated with the particle, and that maps onto like a halo of your mass. I'm glad I asked. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 From uh, at the beginning of the after the Big Bang, but this mm -hmm. will kind of have different structure behavior at the the current universe that we can study. 
but I don't think you can give a number of the velocity. Um, well, people it, do simulation put a number of velocity and the different people do. Uh, they put in, it's, it's what the initial condition is basically. What's the velocity initially? Mm -hmm. Okay, so okay, so now let's move to later on the fourth throne. So what SDS has discovered is a group of another dwarf galaxy is called ultra thin dwarf galaxy. So different from this classical dwarf galaxy like Phonex, which is luminous, you can see there's only about a hundred stars there, or even less, um, yeah, a few hundred stars in those subhalos. And what we realized is the astrophysic process prevents star forming from uh, in star from forming in these most low mass halos. So we didn't see those old things, uh, those dwarf galaxies uh, before. And uh, soon after 2000, when the Sloan turns out, <coughs> there's a burst of the discovery of the ultra faint dwarf galaxies. So number of the dwarf that we know uh, goes up uh, tremendously. And then soon after dark energy we turned on in about late 2014, I don't know when it turned on, but the discovery was started about 2014, and there is a, a big kind of boost in, in terms of the total uh, dwarf galaxy population kind of doubles the size. And here you can see the two jump corresponding to the, the, D, uh, the year one and year two, the data, internal data release in the dark end survey. Another one to point out is this plot is never up to date because this, I think we plot it at the end of 2016. And then just two or three weeks ago, this more actually discovered. So, I need to update this, but uh, we haven't done that yet. So it's really keep updating. Another thing I want to point out is these field dots here are all the confirmed dwarf galaxy, which means that we go follow up them spectroscopically, and then we know that they are dominated by dark matter, so they are dwarf galaxies. Well, most of those, the one that we newly discovered, are still open uh, uh, candidates, uh, open circles here, which means are candidates. So we still need to follow them up a kinematic to confirm whether or not they are dwarf galaxies. Okay, so this is the plot showing you uh, the classic dwarf galaxies that in blue found the before Sloan, and then these red dots here that was discovered in Sloan. And then another jump is from dark energy survey, and this is the footprint of the dark energy survey, and these are the dwarf galaxies that was discovered in the dark energy survey, corresponding to year one and year two. Uh, here is a plot showing you the brightness, or say, no, so uh, the luminosity, or say, the apparent magnitude of the of those dwarf galaxies as a function of the distance to the galaxy center. So again, minus eight, MV of minus eight is around the uh, border between classical dwarf and ultra faint dwarf. So these are the things before find before Sloan, and these are find in Sloan, and the magenta ones are the one find in the in the dark energy survey. And one thing you need to notice is you can see there's a bias here. Doesn't mean that there's no, nothing there. It's just that the current survey depth is not allowed us to probe deeper. And that's something further on the LSST can probe. But uh, it's a big sample that uh, that we have found now with DES. And uh, again, we need to go actually look at each, the individual of those to actually to get their velocity and uh, to confirm if they are actually a dwarf galaxy or not. So the discovery of these ultra faint galaxies dramatically increased the number of known satellite in the Milky Way. And on the other side is also success in the simulations that when they include the baryonic feedbacks, they predict fewer luminous subhalos in the Milky Way. So this is a plot of the luminosity function, so number of uh, dwarf galaxies brighter than certain luminosity as a function of the luminosity of so the order of magnitude. And this is only a simulation for the uh, classical dwarfs, so you can see the MV is brighter than minus eight. And uh, the solid one shows the dark matter only simulation. And when you include baryons, so you can get hyper, including the hyper simulation, you get those uh, open ones, and you can see the number of dwarf galaxies also goes up. So it's like uh, on the observational side, we are finding more on the simulation side, they are going down. So it's kind of in a good, good, at least direction that the, the, the missing side of the problem is gonna, going to solve. Or it's not any a problem, it's something, a good powerful tool to understand the nature of dark matter, but it's not a crisis anymore. However, if we really want to push this, go to lower luminosity or to ultra faint dwarfs, one question we really need to understand is 
about the star formation in these ultra faint dwarfs and what is causing this inefficient star formation in this low mass subhalo. And that goes to my second part of my motivation is galaxy formation. Even though it's for we say in dwarf galaxies it's important for, for the nature of dark matter, also for cosmology, but we still want to understand the galaxy formation inside of these uh, low mass subhalos. So first of all, what is galaxy? There's a lot of definition, especially people work on extragalactic astronomy. We have probably different definition of galaxy, but uh, this is one of the things that I saw that uh, in Wellman and the Shadows uh, paper, they say that the galaxy is a gravitational bond collection of stars whose property cannot be explained by burial physics. Or in other words, the galaxy has to have dark matter. This is plot of mass to light ratio versus total mass, so including the, the baryon and dark matter mass. And uh, you can see these are galaxies, and the, our Milky Way is around 10 to the 12 here. And if you go to the smaller mass, there's a group of things that we find in our own Milky Way, it's called the Galactic Cluster. And this is mass to light ratio in solar units. So mass to light ratio of one is really where our sun is. So here is dark matter three, and this is dark matter dominated galaxies. And then the question is, when we go to smaller mass, what it will be? Will it have a connection with the global cluster? And the answer is no. When we go to the smaller and smaller uh, mass, or say we go to the region of dwarf galaxies, you can see the mass to light ratio goes up rather than goes to the global cluster. So at the same kind of say, a total mass, there is a large deviation between the global cluster and the, the dwarf galaxies. And the mass can go as high as 200 solar mass to solar luminosity, or say a thousand solar mass to solar luminosity. So it makes a very big discrepancy between the dwarf galaxy, which is dark matter dominated, and the goblin cluster are baryon dominated. But we still don't understand what is causing that discrepancy. And then the question here, what will this continue going up when we see a, a fainter or smaller dwarf galaxies? And what about this area? Are there any galaxies existing there? And how about here? These are all the questions we can ask. And then the, the, another thing is, what is causing this? What is causing that in a smaller mass, the galaxy somehow stop forming stars? And that's why the mass to ratio is so high. Okay. So this is one of the uh, study that uh, using the Milky Way dwarf galaxies and the local modern dwarf galaxies to understand the, understand the uh, quenching of the of the of the dwarf galaxies. In small, in low mass, and here plotting the ratio of the hydrogen mass versus the dynamical mass as a function of distance to the um, Milky Way center. So these are all the Milky Way dwarfs, and none of those uh, shows any star formation. Uh, the LMC and SMC is not plotted here, but other than that, all these uh, ultra faint dwarf galaxies show uh, no star formation because they have uh, uh, no detection of neutral hydrogen gas. While the few galaxies, most of those beyond the very radius, has a star formation and has a lot of gas. So what is causing this kind of transition? And where actually the transition happened is a question. And is this related to the distance to the center? So it's related to the gas stripping. Basically, uh, the gas gets stripped out while those the 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 the, the, the Milky Way works close to the Milky Way center gets stripped either through ramp pressure stripping or through tidal stripping. So this is one possibility. And uh, also there's another study showing here is the cumulative uh, star formation history, or you can understand as a percentage of stars in the y-axis, and axis is, is the age of the star. Here it's showing you the six of these quiescent dwarf galaxies, those red uh, ones, one of the six, uh, six of the, these, plotting them as a function of age. And this is showing you what the age of, the, of these stars in, in those dwarf galaxies. And the conclusion from this study is 80% of the stars formed 30 million years ago, and 100% of the stars formed 12 million years ago. So the star formation shut down around the redshift of 6, 5-ish, uh, right after the reionization. So what is causing these? Or is this the, the, the mechanism that caused the, the, the star formation the shutdown at the early universe? So, it's stripping versus reionization, the different mechanism doing this, and that's something also we want to understand. 
Okay, the last part of the motivation will be the indirect dark matter detection, and maybe some people, especially in high energy physics, will be interested. So this is kind of a Fermi diagram, kind of Fermi diagram for dark matter physics. So you have some kind of dark matter, dark matter, and interact, and you may have some standard model particle come out, for example, gambling. And the dark matter, uh, and this annihilation uh, rate scaled as the density squared. So uh, when the dark matter density is high, then there will higher likelihood that you will see a annihilation signal. And actually, if you, the, if you look at the Fermi data that is a gamma ray satellite in the in the, uh, in the sky, and uh, look at the center of the of the galaxy, you will see a kind of residual map. And this is kind of a signal of of the axis of the galaxy center. One interpretation will be dark matter annihilation. However, there also can be other possibilities like the millisecond pulsar or outburst of gamma rays. So instead of using the galaxy center, we can give us a good smoking gun, but still we want to use independent method to <coughs> prove or disprove that this is actually an axis from the uh, dark matter annihilation. So these dwarf galaxies that they are extremely uh, dark matter dominated, and they have very high mass to light ratio, and they have very high dark matter density, and they don't form any stars because they shut down. They provide us a very clean source in opposite to those uh, galactic S, uh, galaxy center. And then we can use them to understand uh, the uh, annihilation cross-section, constrained annihilation cross-section of dark matter, dark matter uh, oh, annihilation. Also, because we can measure the, um, because this is a, a, a system that is self-funded, so we can actually use the Kinematics derived from stellar uh, uh, spectroscopy to infer the, the uh, dynamical mass and then to use that to constrain the cross section of limit. So, this is the result that from uh, before the ES Milky Way work has been formed. So, here you can see the annihilation cross section as a function of the dark matter mass. And these circles and uh, this uh, cross showing you the detection of the galactic axis from the Fermi lattice signal from different groups. And uh, these discoveries are very well in line with the thermoregic cross section what that actually uh, actually from from those uh, theory groups that uh, if if dark matter is weak and it was produced thermally, then that's where the, the cross section would be. So it's exciting. But uh, this is the kind of constraint from the from the dwarf galaxies. So what we get is the the kinematics from the stars in the dwarf galaxy to constrain the dark matter density. And then we, if there's no signal from those dwarf galaxies, we can put an up limit on it. And that's kind of the result we have now. If later on we can we can put in all the Milky Way dwarfs that we discovered in DS. If there's still no annihilation signal detected before that, then we can push this line way down and then move out the uh, axis in the galaxy center that are from the dark matter annihilation. And if these are real, then we should be able to see some signal in the in the uh, in the uh, those dwarf galaxies uh, in the new four dwarf galaxies. So so this is something hopefully we'll soon be able to answer. Okay, so. I spent, I know, I spent about 30 minutes to give the uh, introduction. But I hope uh, you get uh, agreement that on that. Uh, I think uh, the Milky Way satellites are good test band for Lambda CD and Paradigm. And it's important uh, for understanding the galaxy formation, and they are ideal site for indirect dark matter search. And the question really we want to ask is so then for these DS dwarf galaxies, are they good candidate? Uh, are they actually dark matter dominant dwarf galaxy? And uh, did they also stop uh, forming stars a long time ago? And uh, are these uh, uh, dwarf galaxies ideal targets for detection of annihilation signal? So if say we need imaging surveys to do the discovery, which we did, the next step we need to do spectroscopic uh, to understand, follow up, to, um, to characterize them. And so the, the, per the work I'm gonna describe next mostly is focused on the precise velocity determination through spectroscopy. And another part I won't touch is the abundance measurement also through spectroscopy. There's experts here working on that part. So I'm, I hope you will hear another talk later on in the future from someone here. So just before, yeah, before I go further, I'll give you another little bit of very quick introduction about 
uh, how we do measurements on resolved stars in these nearby galaxies three methods, photometry, astrometry, and spectroscope. So for photometry, what we do is color magnet diagram, we get brightness and, or brightness and color, and so that we can infer the distance, stellar mass, and maybe age. And from, astro uh, yeah. and from astrometry, we, get the, uh, we can get the position of the star, and from that, we can get the size of the uh, dwarf galaxy, and also the proper motion if we have some good uh, astrometry. And then for the spectroscopy, what we use is a line position and line strength to measure things about the line of sight velocities through Doppler shift, the chemical abundance, and also the dynamical mass. And I'm going to give a, a one slide to tell you how we do this dynamical mass. And then this is basically what I'm going to focus on for, for the later results. So dynamical mass is important. First of all, it's important to confirm whether or not it's a dark matter uh, dominant dwarf galaxy. Second, it's important because it directly gives us the constraint on the annihilation cross section. It's using very simple physics, basically, it's very serious. So, the kinematic potential and the gravi gravitational yes, has some relation, right? And uh, because it, uh, those dwarf galaxies are dispersion supported system, so we can actually use the dispersion and the size of the system to infer its total dynamical mass. And for these dwarf galaxies, the dispersion is at about several kilometers per second, which is intrinsic scattering of the system. So in order to measure the velocity dispersion <coughs> to infer the mass, we need to measure the velocity accuracy to about a, uh, to a level about one kilometer per second. Or say we want to measure the position of the line better than 0.01 angstrom. And so here showing you a histogram of the velocities and these are kind of uh, the stars that uh, relate to one of the dwarf galaxies called Sigma One. So you can see there is a width here. This width is associated with two things. One is intrinsic scattering. One is the uncertainty of your velocity measurement. So in order to measure the intrinsic scattering, you need to know the velocity uncertainty very well. So it's not only the velocity we want to measure. We also want to make sure the estimation of velocity uncertainty is accurate. So this is the instrument we use for discovery, and that's the uh, Blanco telescope at CTIO. And we got an image, and then we do some filtering algorithm to find the over density using DECAM. If you go about two to three hundred miles away, then you go to another mountain, still in Chile, still in La Serena, and then you will see these two telescopes, Magellan, two, two 6.5 meter telescope. And here I'm going to show you the one of the instruments we use there. IMAX. I don't know what that means, but uh, it's my IMAX. It's, and uh, here I give you a very quick overview of the IMAX instrument. It actually has also F2 component here, but we are not using it, so I'm not showing here. So here is where the focal plane that from the telescope, and here you also put in a slip, um, slip, map, slip mask, and the light goes to the collimator, and this is where the grating and then goes to the camera and then dispersed on these. And this is one of the masks how it looks like. So we select the, the, the stars and the target the slit and put them, uh, we, we design the mask and put the slit according to the photometry from the ES. And uh, this is kind of a zoom in of the part of the mask. And this is before the grading is pointing in and you see the slit position. This is spectral dimension, this is the spatial dimension. And then once you put the grading in and you shoot a, a arc lamp, and then these are the atomic lines you see that we use for wavelength calibration. And if you put on the on the sky to take a, a exposure on the star, this I think is about an hour exposure. This is what you get the, the, the spectrum for those stars. And these are the emission lines that we actually, it's good and bad. In terms of bad, because it's just noisier because it has more background, sky background. But it's good in terms of these sky emission lines give us additional lines to do a wavelength recalibration. If there is a shift between this uh, atomic line, like an arc frame, and the actual exposure, we can do a recalibration. It's important for us. So this is the extracted one spectrum, and I'm just putting, showing one part of it centered on the calcium tripping line. So these are the stellar features. And because of these stellar absorption lines, we can use them to measure the velocities. So you can see the signal. this is kind of the brightest star we have, and this is kind of the faintest star we have, and this is from a nine-hour exposure on 
five meter telescope. And the one to point out is the resolution for the setup we're using is about 30 kilometers per second, and the accuracy we want is about one kilometer per second. So it's really a 30th of the line. And that's kind of challenging for us to deal with this to reach our one kilometer per second velocity. Goal. There's a lot of things we do to make this. Uh, uh, do what we want, but I'm gonna. And there's a lot of systematics that kind of we need to consider before we reach that depth, uh, to reach that accuracy. And here I'm showing you just one quick example how we do this, and what kind of uh, systematics we might have, and how we deal with it. So this is uh, say one slit right, which is about 0.7 arc second, and this is the slit length. And say what we want in ideal world, we want the structure to be in the center of the slit. However, there might be a lot of reasons due to either the mask making or due to the photometry or sorry, astrometry of the, of the catalog itself. The star might be a little bit centered, and that is possible. And we won't be able to tell really just from the spectrum itself without any, any regular um, uh, reduction. And what you will see, a spectrum is like shifted by a few, maybe a few tenths of angstrom or a few hundreds of angstrom. It's small. I'm um, exaggerating here. But the thing is you want to measure the, the, the shift due to the misalignment. So what we do actually is go to these, another different wavelengths. So these are the from home, oh, I shouldn't do a quiz, but anyway. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, so this is a from home for A-band. So that the absorption from the oxygen lines and from, uh, from the Earth's atmosphere. So those lines are independent of the, of the mesentery. So we actually go to those lines and then to check if there's any, any of the mesentery due to, due to uh, sorry, any of the, uh, the velocity shift due to the mesentery and correct for that. So this is one of the examples and uh, there's other examples I'm not talking in detail here. But the, the, the final goal is we try to reach a snap for about one kilometer per second. Okay, so now let me go to the results. Uh, so I'm going to talk about, so again, I show this plot again, is the dwarf, the dwarf galaxy, the, the, the luminosity as function of distance, and uh, this is the, the, the other one that is discovered. And uh, we need to start from somewhere to follow some of those. So we just pick uh, two of them. One is the nearest one in the DES, and actually also almost nearest <coughs> one in the other one, you know, and the, another one is the farthest one that's also discovered in DES. So we started with these two papers, and uh, both of them are uh, submitted, accepted uh, uh, early this year. And I'm going to focus on these two papers in my next few minutes of the talk. Okay, so I'll start with Eridanus 2. Eridanus 2 is the dwarf galaxy candidate discovered in the first year DES data, and it has a distance about 370 kiloparsec from the Milky Way center. So it's beyond the Milky Way barrier radius which is around 300 kiloparsec. And so it is also one of the farthest dwarf galaxies in the Milky Way. So this is a full, uh, sorry, sorry, um, image of uh, Eridana, so you probably can see kind of a few blue stars there that is uh, related. But this is really color contrast, it's not real, I would say. And uh, here is a color magnet diagram of, uh, of uh, Eridanus 2 from the Copsoft paper. And in their paper they said this is uh, the, the isochrome with uh, 12 giga year, and that's the majority of the Eridanus 2. However, they see a group of stars here that can be well fitted for, for a much younger at 250 milli year, and a much uh, higher rich metallicity, and at the same distance. So those two lines, you know, they look very different, but they are at the same distance. But uh, this group of stars can be well explained by a much younger population. So is it possible? Because it is beyond the very radius of the Milky Way. So is it possible that it is beyond our Milky Way and uh, beyond, uh, beyond the very radius of the Milky Way as to form the stars? So that's why it makes this... I'm oh, sorry, Jane, where's the main sequence for the, for the blue line? Where did all the main sequence stars go? So it's also like that. It's beyond this diagram. So the turnoff is much much younger, right? This is basically. Sorry, so yeah, they were all the turnoff stars. Then. I think for this one, it's it's these. I guess. That, that one. But but then you are oh you are saying it's not yeah, showing there here. Are, there are any stars there? I, I don't know that one. It's really two fifty million years, so it's really young. I never worked with the, the actual IMF for that. Well, 
But I guess you're right. It should Even if it's sun, young, it's got to be. You turn the off sun was bright when it was young, too. Uh, yeah, uh, I agree. Uh, we should cross something. I think those are because uh, the turn off should be brighter, right, for, for a younger age, right? Yeah. So I think those are. And you are right. It's obvious. It's not nothing there. But anyway, that's what they claim that there might be a star forming. It's to start forming. If it's real, then it's the smallest star forming galaxy ever known. But, uh, uh, but that's just the, the discovery paper. And that's why I make this target super interesting. And uh, this is another mega cam follow up on the TDS image of just zooming the central part. And you can see there is a, that one is a cluster, a central cluster. Uh, there, so it is the smallest galaxy processing a center star cluster, and that actually I'll mention later on. It also gives us opportunity to constrain the martial dark matter abundance, which is not part I give you in the introduction, but it's something surprising that we can use that to do martial constraints. So this, all this reason makes this target super interesting. Okay, so we followed up use the instrument and technique I mentioned at the beginning, and this is the result. So this is a color magnet diagram of the confirmed member showing in red and uh, in the spatial uh, distribution and the velocity distribution. And you can see this peak is a signature of the very too. You know, identified a total of 28 members. And from that, we talked about the velocity dispersion about 7 kilometers per second and inferred a mass to a light ratio of about 40, 420 solar mass to solar luminosity. So the conclusion is every diamond's two is a dark matter dominant dwarf gas. And then we asked the question earlier, are those stars related to Eridamus 2? And is it the smallest star forming galaxy? And the answer is none of those stars that we, we follow all of these, and none of them are actually uh, uh, associated members with Eridamus 2. It's just a chance of, uh, that it's in the same part of the sky. So there's no sign of recent star formation for this young population. And actually, if you go to look at the neutral hydrogen versus the dynamical mass, as what I mentioned in the introduction, and you can see it's just similar to all the Milky Way dwarfs that we know within the barrier radius. It has no uh, detection of the uh, neutral hydrogen gap. Then we'll make super interesting saying why beyond the barrier radius, and we know that one of the dwarf galaxies, DOT, is about 400 kiloparsec from the center of the Milky Way. It's only 50 kiloparsec from Eridamus 2, but one is gas rich, while every two is gas poor. And they even have similar velocity, so they are all moving towards the Milky Way. So, one thing we need is a proper motion to follow up both of them and to see if the, the orbit makes a difference in, the, in the causing this different star formation uh, history or star formation rate in the two dwarf galaxies. And actually, we have the first epoch of Hubble data already, and just need to wait a little bit long time, and then to get the second epoch to get the proper motion of this target. And uh, as I mentioned earlier about this module constraint, so module constraint is extremely interesting nowadays after LIGO come out, because, uh, so this is a part of the abundance of dark matter if it is module, so module stands by massive, compact, halo object. Right, and the, as a function of natural mass, so this is a bump. <coughs> so the fraction of, of macho being, being the dark matter. And this part is moved out by macho experiment. So basically they, they find this micro lensing event and then try to rule out uh, the being ground dwarf or uh, black holes, etc. And this is ruled out by the white batteries. So it's very similar to the later thing I will mention. So the idea is the existence of white boundaries. If there is a lot of dark, massive uh, macho object, then they will kind of into, uh, combine and then disrupt these white boundaries. So the existence of white boundaries kind of tell us the, the macho uh, the macho boundaries can be higher than say 40 percent. So that's how it comes up. So because every two has a, a center and star cluster, and there's a theory paper saying the macho uh, will dynamic heat the cluster until it dissolves. It's very similar to the white binary, basically saying the star cluster itself is there, but if there is machos flying by, because dwarf galaxy is highly dark matter dominated, and they can just, in, how, how to say, like 
interact with the, 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 the star cluster and, and dissolve it if, if it's made of large elements. So we use uh, kinematics, we calculate in this paper and make the constraints, and that's what is ruling out. And this gap is extremely interesting. It's between like 10 solar mass to 100 solar mass because the LIGO detection last year was all around 30 solar mass. So I think, oh, maybe it's not this kind of module, but it's from the module black hole that created an artifact band. Then uh, it might be really the, the candidate of dark matter. This is a one way of using dwarf galaxies to rule out and to kind of fill this gap. But I have to admit that uh, we did have a few assumptions. For example, it is actually a central star cluster, which we don't really know because it is in the center from the sky, but it can be a little bit in front or uh, behind the, the center of the, of the dwarf galaxy. And also another thing is we also did a calculation. If, the, of, if there is an intermediate black hole in the, in the center of the global cluster, then that kind of tight the, can kind of constrain the, 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 the star cluster from dissolving from the module. So that's also kind of lower the constraints towards the, uh, that way, so that's this red line is showing. But anyway, this is uh, one of the independent group to constrain the module. Okay, now I'll move to the Takana 3. So dwarf galaxy, this is a dwarf galaxy discovered in the year two, and it is very close to the sun. It's only 25 kiloparsec from the sun, so it's one of the nearest work in the Milky Way. And uh, <coughs> we have a very good candidate for indirect dark matter search because the dark, indirect dark matter search uh, always wanted to have like the closer ones. And the most interesting part is that it has a linear structure around this dwarf galaxy. So it might be the first ultra faint dwarf galaxies on the tide of this disruption. And that's why I make it super interesting. And what we did with IMAX is just follow the center of the of the, the core of the dwarf galaxy. We didn't look for the, 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 the tails because it needed a lot, much larger field of view instrument to do that. So I'm gonna talk about the observation we did for the core of the, of the taxon. So this is, uh, again, the result for the color member diagram, the spatial distribution and velocity distribution. You can see we got about 26 members identified for the form of a very narrow peak. However, from what we got, we only can put an up limit for the velocity dispersion of about 1.5 with 95 confidence, 95% confidence, yeah. And uh, the inferred mass to light ratio is 240. So the velocity dispersion for uh, TAC3 is not resolved. Uh, we can't really say if it's dwarf galaxy or global cluster, but we try to make a plot <coughs> here to classify it. So this is showing you the luminosity versus half light radius. Uh, the black dots here are global clusters, and the open yellow, yeah, the open uh, blue circles are the dwarf galaxies. And you can see, um, according to the, I say, brightness versus size. Uh, uh, Kind of three in red is more likely to be a dwarf galaxy. And this is mass to light ratio versus uh, the luminosity. Again, we only have up limit, but it can be anything between here to here, which, which we still don't know where, where it is. However, from the metallicity, this is metallicity versus luminosity, you can see we don't really see any globular cluster at this uh, luminosity has such a manual poor population. But this gives us a confidence thinking it's more likely to be a uh, dwarf galaxy. But uh, still, we need a more kind of direct evidence, and that requires a future follow-up. Another thing I want to point out is, even if it is a dwarf galaxy, if we can actually get a measure of someone here, it is still will be one of the uh, smallest, uh, uh, lowest mass dwarf galaxy, and it won't be actually ideal for dark matter search. Okay, so all these work basically put two dots here, right? And uh, even one of them can't really put it color, but we, we did that. I, I didn't do that, someone did that, but I put the question mark there. So that's like the work for the two of those. And you can see there's way more here we need to follow up, and there's more coming up every month, series every month. And uh, so this is something I mentioned before about dwarf galaxy and global cluster and the star formation. So we want to see where Eridanus 2 and the Takana 3 goes into this picture. So that's where it is. So Eridanus 2 is very similar to other dwarf galaxies we know. It's right on this low side. <coughs> Takana 3 is 
only have upper limit, so it only goes there and there. So it's very extraordinary terms is low sign. One way to explain this is because we see the tidal tails around type of three, so it has tidal disruption. If say it's 90% of the uh, stellar mass be disrupted and uh, and uh, what we are seeing is only 10% of them, then we will move the no, not only the the stellar mass but also the the, the, the dark matter mass. So move this to the one of, one magnitude this way and maybe somewhere that way. So that we will actually fill on this low side. So this is very different from the other but because it is also on the tidal disruption. And also it will be very interesting to follow up that later. Uh, like further. And this is the star formation plot I showed at the beginning. So again this is neutral hydrogen mass versus dynamical mass as a function of distance. And where a redundance two line on is here. Again, it's very different from the most of the star forming galaxy, which is beyond this very mass. So this also makes it very interesting, and in and in we want to see that if we can find more such kind of dwarf that beyond the very radius, but to have some relation to tell us where the transition happens. Okay, and then go back to the wind annihilation at the beginning. I mentioned for the indirect dark matter detection. So unfortunately, neither Kona 3 and Arizona 2 is ideal candidate for direct dark matter search, uh, indirect dark matter search. Uh, the Arizona 2 is just too far away, and the Kona 3 has just low the period of mass. But we have a lot of more going on, and that's what we are working on now. So I only talk about one instrument of which I like, uh, uh, of the two papers that we work on. We also have data from BLT, from CAC, from AAT and from different instruments all over the world and to work on this and uh, that's something I'm working on. So I'll stop here for my talk that is usually going to the public because everything is published so far. But I hope you guys get the information that the Milky Way works are ideal targets to, to do from cosmology to galaxy formation. And uh, we are working on that. And I talk mostly kinematics today, but I hope you will hear some talk about chemical balance later. If anyone asks questions, I will answer something that is not published. Thanks. I forget how many hits these get, actually. It's not really, it's not trusting, yeah, no, guys. It's just a policy thing that 